Good evening. I'm Ann Lillis, the Head of Department of Accounting, and it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, each of you on behalf of the University of Melbourne and CPA Australia to what is a milestone event in the life of the annual research lecture. I'll shortly invite to come forward to formally open proceedings the Chancellor of the University of Melbourne, Ms Elizabeth Alexander. Before we commence, I'd like you to note that this public lecture is being recorded, so any comments you make or questions you ask during the question time uh, may be or will be recorded. It's very fitting that we have the Chancellor here to open proceedings tonight. Ms Alexander has, a long, has long standing connections to both the University of Melbourne and to CPA Australia. Having previously served as National and State President, she's a life member of CPA Australia. It was her term as National President which saw the achievement of legal backing to accounting standards in Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great privilege to invite to the podium to introduce the annual research lecture, the Chancellor of the University of Melbourne, Ms Elizabeth Alexander. Thanks very much. You've probably been cursing ever since legal backing to standards, but uh, that's where we are. So look, it gives me very great pleasure to welcome you here this evening to the 75th CPA Australia University of Melbourne Annual Research Lecture. And it gives me great pleasure because not only my Chancellor, I was a former student in this faculty and I think a member for a very short time, uh, as well as my association with CPA Australia. In our customary way, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this lecture is presented, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and we respectfully recognise their elders past and present. I'd like to extend a very cordial welcome to the President of the Victorian Division of CPA Australia, Professor Brendan O'Connell, the CPA Australia board members and council members. Welcome also to the faculty, to alumni and students of the university, to delegates from the CPA Congress, members of CPA Australia and of the profession, to members of the Fitzgerald family and to the general public. I wish also to welcome our presenter of tonight's lecture, Sir David Tweedy. And tonight we are joined by colleagues from far afield, interstate and abroad and from across industry and academia to mark this significant milestone, the 75th lecture in this series. The lecture series represents a strong and enduring partnership between CPA Australia and the University of Melbourne. It was October 1940 when CPA Australia, then known as the Commonwealth Institute of Accountants, partnered with the university to hold its first lecture, which was presented by Sir Alex Fitzgerald. Sir Alex was a pioneer in accounting research in his lecture. The field for research in accountancy set the stage for a sustained discourse on contemporary accounting issues. I well remember as a student labouring over his textbook that he'd written. In ensuring years, these lectures would cover many topics, but have always centred on tackling significant contemporary issues of the day. In 75 years, we've seen remarkable changes in accounting and business practice and legislation, changes to theory and practice, and the growth of the standard setting process. Through this time, the annual research lecture series has evolved and adapted as has the field of accounting itself, to stay relevant and reflect changing views and priorities. And we look forward to the continuation of this great tradition tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, my thanks to all of you for being here and again on behalf of the university, a warm welcome. I'll now call on the head of the Department of Accounting, Professor and Lillis to acknowledge former presenters of this lecture who are here with us tonight and to introduce our distinguished guest speaker of the evening, Sir David Tweedy. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chancellor. Ladies and gentlemen, as you've heard, the annual research lecture 
has indeed a proud tradition. Those who presented this lecture are drawn from an illustrious list of prominent researchers and practitioners who've tackled challenging questions, presented new ideas, and offered thought leadership within the discipline. To mark the occasion of the 75th lecture, we invited all living past presenters to attend this evening. Many, of course, are overseas and were unable to attend. However, we have nine past presenters here with us. I'd now like to introduce the past speakers who are in attendance tonight, commencing with the most recent. Uh, 2012, Professor Naomi Soderstrom from the University of Melbourne on the topic Sustainability Reporting, Past, Present and Trends for the Future. 2007, Professor Stuart Leach, University of Melbourne, The Use and Misuse of Intelligent Systems in Accounting, The Risk of Technology Dominance. 2006, Mr. Kevin Stevenson, Australian Accounting Standards Board. Fair value, the right measurement basis. 1997, Mr. Peter Day, Director, The Future for Accounting Standards in Australia. 1995, Professor Margaret Abernathy, University of Melbourne, Healthcare in Victoria. 1991, Professor Emeritus Robert Nicholl from the University of Melbourne, The Dividend Puzzle, an Australian solution. 1984, Associate Professor Malcolm Miller from University of New South Wales, The Direction and Structure of Financial Reporting in Australia, Learning from the Accomplishments and Failure in the US Effort to Develop a Conceptual Framework. 1982, Professor Emeritus Robert Officer from Acorn Capital, Valuation Problems in an Inflationary Environment. And finally, and I won't say the oldest presenter here, <laughs> but the earliest, Professor Emeritus Ken Wright on the, from the University of Melbourne, is there a science of cash management? Ladies and gentlemen, could I please ask you to put your hands together and join me in thanking these past presenters, both for their contributions to accounting thought and for being here tonight to share in this important event. We're absolutely delighted that this evening joining this long line of influential and talented speakers is an internationally celebrated scholar and standard setter, Sir David Tweedy. Throughout his career, Sir David has most notably undertaken roles as an academic, technical director of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland, UK national technical partner of KPMG, president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland, chair of the Accounting Standards Board, and the inaugural chair of the International Accounting Standards Board from 2001 until 2011. Sir David was educated at Edinburgh University, graduating with first class honours with his Bachelor of Commerce in 1966, and going on to complete his PhD in 1969, and became a Scottish Chartered Accountant in 1972. After teaching at Edinburgh University, he became Technical Director of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland in 1978. In 1982, he commenced as National Technical Partner of Thomson McClintock & Co, a role he carried on when the entity merged with Pete Marwick Mitchell & Co to form KPMG. His time as Chairman of the UK Accounting Standards Board and then as the first chairman of the International Accounting Standards Board, marked a period of significant and unprecedented reform of accounting standards. Sir David is a fellow of the Judge Business School at Cambridge University and a visiting professor of accounting in the Management School at Edinburgh University. He's received honorary degrees from nine British universities and received a knighthood in 1994. He was inducted into the Accounting Hall of Fame in 2013. Sir David was appointed Chairman of the International Valuation Standards Council in October 2012. He also chairs the Royal Household Audit Committee for the Sovereign Grant and is Chairman of the Scottish Charities Luhi House, which gives respite care to those with degenerative diseases, and the ICAS Foundation, which assists young students from disadvantaged backgrounds seeking to enter into university study. His topic, Changing the Image of the Profession, the Fight for Economic Reality in Accounting and the Increasing Value of the Audit, promises to address important issues of interest to practitioners, regulators, and educators. So now, 
to present the 75th CPA Australia University of Melbourne Annual Research Lecture, I would like to invite to the lectern, would you warmly put, please warmly welcome Sir David Tweedy. Well, thank you, Anne. I think you mentioned everything except the fact I was born by caesarean section, which is apropos of nothing, except I have this great compulsion always to leave a room by means of a window instead of a door. <laughs> uh, Madam Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, uh, can you all hear me? I'm always reluctant to ask that question after my lecturing days at Edinburgh University when a voice from the back said, yes, but I'm willing to change with anyone who can't. Uh, it's a great pleasure to come here and uh, deliver this uh, research lecture. Uh, I have given one before in the Antipodes. In uh, 1985, I gave the uh, New Zealand Society of Accountants uh, research lecture. It was so successful, they've never had another one since. <laughs> so it's a, a great pleasure to be the 75th uh, lecturer on this particular occasion. There was a Texas billionaire who used to have the, the most wonderful parties. And at the end of these parties, he always did something rather different. And on this particular occasion, he took his guests down to his swimming pool, which he'd filled with rather large and rather hungry crocodiles. And he said, the first man to swim the length of this pool can have either $10 million, the ranch next door, or the hand of my daughter in marriage. And the words were hardly out of his mouth, and the splash, and this fellow was coming through the pool, shouldering crocodiles out of the way. And he pulled him out the other end, and the billionaire said, that's fantastic. What would you like? $1 million? $10 million? No, 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 he said. The ranch? No, 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 no. Uh, my daughter? No, no, lovely lady though she is. Well, he said, what would you like? He said, I'd like to find the guy who pushed me in. And <laughs> my career's been a bit like that. Looking back at the beginning of uh, my time in the profession, two major differences stand out from today. There were numerous accounting firms. The big eight was almost the big 10. Now we're down to the big four and the middle-sized firms have virtually disappeared. There was no accounting standards when I was a CA apprentice. Issues arising which couldn't be dealt with in the normal general practice were dealt with by the audit team, with other partners, and they'd work out a solution and that'd be that. A year or two later, a series of scandals led to the creation of the UK Accounting Standards Board and now, like over 130 countries, the UK has adopted IFRS. Some 2,500 pages of standards. US GAAP is 17,500. And almost after the UK had adopted Australia, and I know Elizabeth was a lot to do with that, adopted IFRSs. Not without discussion, not without questions. I remember coming across to see the Australian government uh, for a series of questions there, but not quite as many as I got from the immigration officer at Sydney Airport. He was not an uncritical admirer of the POMs, and for some quarter of an hour asked me some pretty impertinent questions, finally ending up asking whether or not I had a criminal record, uh, to which I replied I didn't realise I still needed one to get into Australia. <laughs> Well, people oppose accounting standards. They often argue that practice sensibly would choose the best practice. Uh, I think that's naive. The growth of equity markets, management incentives, increasing demands by shareholders, all conspire to pressure management to show companies an advantageous light. To some, volatility is unwelcome. Smooth earnings are really more controllable. On occasion, draft accounting standards uh, are opposed and politicians lobbied to try and stop the standard setters bringing it in. If change is inevitable, then delay seems preferable. Requests for field tests, further exposure, economic effect analyses have all been called for and have delayed the introduction of unpopular standards. Some would argue that instead of a suite of standards, all we need is a conceptual framework. When I was an apprentice accountant, there were countless conceptual frameworks. Each partner had his own. Even when standard setters began work, different working parties, different board members, all had their idea of what accounting should be and what it should do. So the conceptual framework was born really to stop revisiting the same argument on numerous occasions. It led to generally agreed objectives of accounting, qualitative characteristics, what is an asset, what's a liability, you'd think we'd know that, but we missed them off the balance sheets, measurement, presentation, and so on. Accountants aren't great consumers of conceptual products. It's, I don't refer to the conceptual framework in the hallowed portals of the English Institute. 
or rather the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales, I keep forgetting the Welsh, but so do they. One of their council's members was heading for Wales on the motorway and stopped for speeding, and he apologised. He said, I was just going to Wales, hate Wales, hate the Welsh. Everyone you meet in Wales, he said, was either a prostitute or a rugby football player. Oh, that's interesting, said the policeman, taking his notebook back out again. My wife's Welsh. Really, he said, what position does she play? <laughs> <laughs> well, the conceptual framework is the standard set as best chance of keeping corporate reporting honest and his defence against vested interest. It's still, however, a work in progress. Much more is to be done on presentation and on measurement. But even in its present form, it has made a major contribution to reforming accounting. The main deficiencies in financial reporting have centred around the failure to recognise assets and liabilities, or to present them or measure them appropriately. I want to give a few examples. Now, some of you have forgotten some of this. I find as you get older, you do forget things. I was in a pub in Edinburgh not so long ago, and an old couple opposite me, and the old boy mentioned he'd been to a pub and had a wonderful meal. So I asked him the name, and he said, oh, goodness, um, give, me the, give me the name of flower, daffodil. No, rose, no, no, lily. That's it, he said. Turned to his wife and said, lily, what was the name of that pub that we had? <laughs> well, leases. You know, I've often said it, much the annoyance of Qantas, that one of my biggest ambitions is to fly in an aircraft that's actually on an airline's balance sheet. And the reason they're not is most of them are not purchased, they're leased. And internationally, leasing standards are perfectly harmonised. They're absolutely useless. And why are they not on? Because we have two forms of lease accounting. Operating leases, where you just put the charge through the P&L accounts, like a rent or capital leases, where the present value of the payments you make are shown as a liability and an asset on the other side. And what's the difference? Well, one is almost a surrogate for buying, and so if you've got most of the risks and rewards, that when it, that's when it goes on. What does that mean? Rule of thumb, if the present value of the payments are 90% of the value of the asset when you start the lease, it's on balance sheet. Guess what? They come in at 88%. And if you dropped it to 80, they'd come in at 79%. And when you look at an aircraft, they only lease it for seven years, so it's nowhere near the, the full value of the, the asset. When you look at the extent of the equipment leasing industry, in 2012, the transactions amounted to 868 billion US dollars, and almost all of that was off balance sheet. The ISB estimates the present value of that, looking forward at all the payments to be made, is 3.4 trillion. US dollars, which if there were a new standard, would be on balance sheet. And global real estate leases are even higher. The G4 group of standard setters, including the WESB, published a paper on new form of lease accounting in 1996, written by my old friend Warren McGregor, who, of course, is a Melbourneian. There was a very simple solution to it. Is a lease a liability or is it not? When you say to the airline, can you get out of this payment? No. Can we measure it? Yes. That's the definition of a liability. And on the other side, the right to the 380 or whatever it is for seven years. Some 18 years after Warren wrote that paper, a new standard is still to be finalized due to extensive lobbying and disagreements among standard setters. But next year, you'll get one. Were they alive today, the partners I trained with, I think, could have probably written the standard in one line. Show the liability you've incurred by signing the lease contract and the rights to the asset obtained thereby. What more do you want? How to deal with residual guarantees or renewal options, possibly. But do we require a lot more? We can write standards dealing with 80% of the issues in some 12 to 15 pages. If you want 95%, it could go up to 400. And that's where we've got to watch it. Leasing is an off-balance sheet issue. When I first went into standard setting, the balance sheet was almost an optional extra. There was so much missed off, it was hardly worth showing what was there. I used to say that on the right side, there was nothing left, and on the left side, there was nothing right. <laughs> and it was so easy to get things off. You know, I hope many of you here like a drink, but one thing you must never drink is a one-year-old whiskey. Because if you do, you lose the flavour and the bouquet, but more importantly, you'll lose your power of speech. <laughs> and distilleries, when they made it, would sell the whisky to a bank. 
and the bank would have an option to put it back to the distillery at the price that was paid for it, plus interest at normal lending rates up to the time of repurchase. And the distillery would have a call option to call it back under exactly the same terms. And the lawyers would tell you it was a sale and inventory disappeared, cash would come in, maybe a little profit. When you look at that transaction, what's going to happen? It's going to come back to the distillery. Price falls, bank will shove it back to avoid the loss. Price rises, the distillery will call it back to get the gain. And it needs it anyway for blending purposes. And the whiskey never left the distillery. And they paid the interest quarterly. And yet they tried to argue it was a sale. It was a loan secured on stock. Another off-balance sheet scheme was pensions. The American standard measured the assets in the fund at fair value. The liabilities were estimated using the AA corporate bond rates. And then it fell to pieces. Let's say you had a pension fund with 40 million assets, 40 million liabilities, and then the assets fell by 10 million. So you have a deficit of 10 million. That's not how it would have been shown. It was argued that some of that fall would be market noise, and they measured that at 10% of whatever was higher in the fund, the assets or liabilities. Well, the assets are at 40 million, so that's 4 million. Deduct that from the 10 million loss, down to 6 million. Pensions are a long-term issue. Spread that over the working lives of the employees, say 10 years. So instead of a deficit of 10 million, you show a deficit of 600,000. Now, you explain that to your granny. You may as well take the 10 million, divide it by the cube root and the number of miles to the moon, and multiply it by your shoe size. It doesn't mean a thing. The British one was just as bad. The actuaries told you how much was needed for the fund, and if you paid more or less, you had, had a prepayment or a liability. You never knew what was in the fund. Both of them had to be swept away. And now, internationally, we show the full deficit. The 10 million will be revealed. Not showing liabilities gets companies into trouble. In the United States, health care was the big issue. Companies gave their employees who had just retired health care from retirement till death. And as people get older, bits fall off. And health care is expensive. And they didn't realize what they'd given away. These are liabilities. People will not work again. There'll be nothing they can do for the company, and yet the company is committed to pay these health care costs. And FASB required them to do that. Well, after they did it, General Motors' net worth declined by 32 billion, which was 78% of its equity, and Ford's by 12 billion, 40% of its equity. They estimated that $1,500 was required before any US car was built. That was the healthcare cost of an automobile in the United States. And you may well wonder why these were the companies that needed help in the height of the financial crisis. The examples I've given you are those that ignore liabilities. But there's also those that created them, and they didn't exist. And that was the British scam of acquisition provisioning. It was probably the biggest scam we had to deal with. Companies would buy another. They would write down its inventory. They would put in liabilities for reorganizations, etc., And then I'll show you how they deal with it. Take a simple company. An inventory of 100 that you can sell for 120. And you buy it for 100. No goodwill. What they did was they then write the inventory down to, say, 60. And then they would provide for reorganization provisions or future losses of 50. So you've now got net worth of 10. Goodwill of 90. In the UK, uniquely at that time, it used to be written off against reserves. And then they'd sell the inventory for 120 show a profit of 60, they'd find they didn't need the reorganization provisions, they'd add them back to the profit and loss account from where they never came, and show another profit of 50. So a profit of 110 by accounting sleight of hand, and that's all. They would claim it was brilliant reforming management, whereas some of them should have been locked up. That was dealt with by the definitions of a liability. If an obligation doesn't exist, and it doesn't at that stage, you can't provide for it. And we dealt with the inventory issue by requiring disclosures of the gains on purchased inventory. And we dealt with goodwill too. It came back on the balance sheet, and you looked at the whole investment and applied an impairment technique to it. Did the investment hold up? Is it still there? And I remember when this impairment approach was first floated internationally, 
the chief accountant at the SEC was almost apoplectic and said, we found the answer to accounting for Goodwill and Brand some 30 years ago, and that was to write them off over 40 years. And as I pointed out to the gentleman in the United Kingdom, we have brands such as Johnny Walker and Gordon's Gin. They're actually older than the United States. And in my humble opinion, I've done more for the sum of human happiness than the United States. <laughs> and personally, I'd write off America before I'd ever depreciate Johnny Walker Blue Label. <laughs> well, these examples of poor accounting, which was dealt with by the conceptual framework, failed to reflect the reality of the situation. Interestingly enough, despite a huge outcry over pension accounting and being forced to show the deficits, within two years, CFOs were telling us that they now discuss pensions in the boardroom. It's sitting right there. It's not invisible. The directors have to discuss it. And the analysts were satisfied by the way companies dealt with it, because they suddenly decided they're going to have to explain how they're going to get rid of this deficit. So it was how much extra they were going to put into the fund each year, what the return on assets was estimated to be, the effect on profit if it stayed at the current levels, and so on. With healthcare costs, companies began to be more careful in what they offered. With leases, we have to wait till next year until we fix it. But the conceptual framework's not complete. Given the latest thinking on concept of control, where does equity accounting fit into this? Before companies were obliged to consolidate cons controlled off-balance sheet vehicles, equity accounting was a way of showing in a single line a consolidation, which underlay the importance of the investment. With control now being the criteria for consolidation, the rationale for equity accounting is considerably weakened. It is, however, still used both for associated company accounting and for joint ventures. In a joint venture, a partner has access to a share of profits and is a party to the arguments on distribution policy where there's only significant influence, whatever that may mean, showing the investor's supposed share of profit in the income statement is not only meaningless, but misleading if the shareholder cannot extract the profit. What does it signal to the analyst? Would the changes in the fair value in the investment and dividends received reflect better the returns on that investment? In other words, why do we treat them as normal investments? Another area of the conceptual framework, which is lacking at the moment, is the presentation of information. The profit and loss account is a mess. There is no rationale to it. Under IFRS at the moment, revaluations, currency tr translation changes in net investments, changes in the pension fund, changes in the value of strategic investments are all shown in other comprehensive income. Why? There is no, at the moment, argument for why these particular items should be there. When you look at them, they're long term. So if you put the revaluation through profit this year or the big change in the pension fund, the analyst would have to remove it to see the underlying trend in profit. But we haven't tried to justify it on a conceptual basis. And some still want all these gains, once the assets, the revalue assets is sold, to come back into profit for that year. And the analyst will have to extract it again. So why doesn't it stay down there and not be recycled? These are issues that have to be dealt with. And there's inconsistencies. If you sell a revalued asset today, you won't bring back the former gains, but you will show the gain on the carrying value. Doesn't make much sense to me. Why don't we keep them all in OCI? Well, the conceptual framework attempts to define the theoretical principles of accounting. But if strong vested interests are there, that doesn't settle the argument. And we look back at some of the issues that cause problems. One that amazes me looking back on it now was the issue of share options. Massive opposition to expensing them as revenue, remuneration. Many arguments were used. Difficulty of measurement, adverse economic consequences of whom? Management. Or the fact that such options had no cost to the company as it was share transaction. Well, terrific. Give us all some. We'll all get rich. Or if you take it to its logical conclusion, if a share transaction has no value, then why do we consolidate with share transactions? Because there's no cost to those either. And it was amazing the level this reached. President Bush, President Chirac all joined in against expensing share options. And yet when you look at the evidence, what was there, in 2001, the earnings of the S&P 500 were overstated by 31% because options were not charged. Furthermore, 
While people said these options went to all employees, 75% of them went to the top five executives. And in the S&P 500, on average, these companies spent $480 million every year buying back shares to stop the dilution effect. Well, divide $480 million by three quarters, the 75%, divide by five, and you get $72 million. That's what the directors were getting. And then they wondered why they got Enron and they got WorldCom as people tried to keep the share price up. The Financial Executives Institute of the United States boasted they spent millions of dollars lobbying Congress to get the SEC to stop the American Accounting Standards Center from expensing share options. At a public meeting, they told us to do the same to us. And I was delighted the following week when the board voted 14 to nil to expense them. As Warren Buffett said, if options aren't a form of compensation remuneration, what are they? If compensation is an expense, what is it? And if expenses don't go through earnings, where in the world should they go? A year after we issued our standard, the US changed from just disclosing the cost of share options to expensing them. Well, if that was our toughest fight when we started, it seemed a minor controversy once the financial crisis hit. For most of my professional life, there's been arguments about the use of fair values and financial reports. Historical re cost is far simpler to audit. It's also, in many cases, far less relevant than current value. Many of us here remember the arguments of inflation accounting. Professors Ginther, Chambers, Matthews, pioneers, internationally famous in this area. Once inflation was conquered, the issue started to go away. But we came to an era where cost was not really reflecting economic reality. So we started to have fair value for agricultural produce, commodities, and above all, financial instruments. In the financial crisis, markets froze. I was a member of the Financial Stability Board, and a few weeks after Lehman's, I remember being in a meeting, and you could sense the fear in the room. They thought the whole system could go down. Many financial institutions were faced with disastrous losses as the fair values tumbled. Well, if they were causing a problem, there was an easy answer, stop using them. And they lobbied governments to allow them to stop using fair value. The European Commission listened, and we discovered they were putting through a law within a week to say that you could change from fair value to cost. Our initial reaction was, let them do it. And then securities regulators led by the SEC got onto us and said, you've got to step in. If you don't step in, these companies are going to add back all their losses. They'll be showing profits at a time everybody knows they're losing. Their numbers will be disbelieved. The markets will implode. And if they implode in Europe, it'll come across the Atlantic. You have to move. So we stepped in. We brought the change which they allowed in the United States. We made them have to bring the assets to cost at the fair value of the time. We made them disclose the effect on the P&L and balance sheet that would have existed had they not used this method. We were torn apart for not using due process. We had six days. There was no due process we could have done. And the alternative was blowing up the, the markets. We'd already been intending to revise IAS 39. I don't know if you've read IAS 39, but if you understand it, you haven't read it properly. And we're going to replace it with a principled model. We had great problems with 39. The French hated it. And I was called into the European Commissioner before we finally published 39 to be told that if we couldn't get the French to agree to it, then he couldn't accept it for Europe. I asked him if he told the French that. He said he had. I said, in that case, we won't get agreement. They don't want it. And he says, well, they've come up with a compromise. The thing they don't really like is showing losses on hedging derivatives through income. So I said, where do they want to show them? In equity? No, he said. Well, we're now starting to run out of options. They're a debit. The only other thing we've got is an asset. He said, that's how they want to show them. So I said, fine. So if I go to BMP Paribas and ask for a loan and they want collateral, I can give them this loss on a derivative, can I? And he says, don't be stupid. And I said, well, who started this? <laughs> we refused, and that became the European carve-out. Only 29 companies did it, mainly French banks. 
IFRS 9 is a principle-based model. If you know the cash flows of an asset, a financial instrument, and you're going to keep it to get those cash flows, you can show it at cost. That only means debts and loans. It's an interest security that would work. Derivatives, equities have to be at fair value. Some will argue that all financial instruments should be marked to market. There's clearly a consistent logic in that. But there could be major consequences. If we required the loan books of British banks to be shown at fair value, the profits of these banks would be much more volatile. Between 2001 and 2006, UK banks' cumulative profits would have been 100 billion higher, pounds billion higher, than recorded profits as expected future returns on risky projects were brought forward. But in 2008, hypothetical losses would have reached in excess of 300 billion, and in 2009 would have peaked at over 400 billion. The total capital resources of British banks at the time was 280 billion, so the British banking system would have been bust on a fair value basis. A few months later, they were back in the black again. Fair value was a convenient target for many politicians during the crisis. Shortly after the collapse of Lehman's, I was interviewed by the BBC World Service. It said, in this crisis, fingers are pointing, and fingers are pointing at you. You are the man who caused this crisis. I said, they're right, it was me. I made banks give up the risk management techniques. I made them give loans to people who had no assets and no income. I made them break up these mortgages into tiny pieces and add them to tiny pieces of thousands of others and scatter them worldwide. I made the credit rating agencies give them AAA ratings. I made people buy them without due diligence. It was all my fault. And there was a pause, and the interviewer said, for the benefit of overseas listeners, that was irony. <laughs> but valuation's a difficult issue. Maybe remote for some of you, coming from Scotland, I'm used to that, of course. When I was at KPMG, I took two of my London partners up to the Hebrides, islands off the west coast of Scotland, for an investigation. And being London partners, they had to keep up to date and went into the news agent to get a copy of the Financial Times. I'm a bit taken aback when the old lady behind the counter said, will you be wanting today's or yesterday's? But coming from London, they had to have today's. Ah, well, she said, you'll have to come back tomorrow. <laughs> The problem I experienced with, in layman's was the fact that the markets had frozen. How do you put a value when there are no sales? And we had to put a working party together to come up with an answer in the middle of the crisis. So when I was asked to take over the International Valuation Standards Council, I wanted to see what they were doing with financial instruments. What's there appalled me. We have standards that say show fair values. You assume they're comparable. They're not. Experiments have shown when Basel were putting out portfolios to various banks, the differences were huge. And so what does that do to our P&L accounts? And what does it do to the balance sheets? And what does it do to financial stability with the Basel capital buffers? We have a major problem, a lacuna in regulation. And that's something that we're going to have to look at. And it's not just the ones in the balance sheets and P&Ls. Disclosure too. Our cooperative bank in the UK went into difficulties in, 20, in 2013. In December 2012, it has shown the fair values of its loan book as being at a premium of 37 million over the, the figures shown in the accounts. Following well-publicised difficulties and regulatory scrutiny, it restated those figures in June the following year. And that showed that the fair value was actually 3.7 billion below the carrying value. These numbers are useless, if that's the sort of variation we're going to get. So where does the auditor, and how does he deal with all this when it happens? Let's look at the audit. So far, accountants have moved towards international accounting standards. They're moving towards international auditing standards. And auditing's come a long way in the 25 years that I've taken a, a big interest in it. As a technical partner of KPMG, I was horrified at some of the things that went on in the city of London. I used to compare the auditor in the 80s to an airport luggage trolley, uh, the only difference being the airport luggage trolley had an independent mind of its own. The global financial crisis led to concerns over the role of the auditor. Why was the investing public not warmed about the impending disaster? And that has caused a problem ever since, and the European moves are related to that. 
My first meeting of an auditor was when I was about 11, and I visited my uncle's small farm just as the auditor was leaving. And he commented he hadn't seen my uncle's horse. No, you wouldn't, said my uncle. I sold it. Well, that's strange, said the auditor. I didn't see the cash going through the cash book. Of course you didn't, said my uncle. I spent it. Well, that won't do, said the auditor. Give me two pounds. So he picked up his two pounds, stuck it in his pocket, picked up his pen and wrote in the cash book, payment to man for burying dead horse, two pounds. Well, in case you're worried about Scottish accountants, let me tell you, none of them would do that these days. Not for two pounds, they wouldn't. <laughs> I think the auditing relationship with the com company needs to be reformed. I think it involves more direct reporting to investors and a change in the structure of the audit. Everybody knows when there's been a bad audit, it's splattered all over the papers. Nobody knows when there's been a really good one. It's hidden. And it's seen by some as a, a commodity. You've got to pay for this, you want capital from the capital market, you've just got to pay for an audit. And the audit opinions are off on switch. Fair presentation, not a fair presentation. When I first started accounting, the audit report was three or four lines long. You could tell at a gran glance if it was qualified. Now you can't find it. It's buried in this boilerplate language that says who's responsible for what. You know, how many auditors does it take to change a light bulb? None. They're too busy forming a committee to say it isn't their responsibility. All that stuff can be taken as read. In the UK, you can now put it on the website. Get out the report. The audit is an activity costing considerable sums of money and should be used to give added value. The Public Companies Accounting Oversight Board in the States stated, and I'll quote, many investors have indicated they would benefit from additional auditor reporting because they do not have access to or may not be aware of much of the information. Additionally, many investors indicated auditors have unique and relevant insight based on their audits and that auditors should provide information about their insight in the auditor's report to make the reports more relevant and useful. In particular, they want to know areas of high financial statement and audit risk, areas of significant auditor judgment, management judgment areas, significant changes or events, including unusual transactions, and where are significant matters disclosed. Instead, we have an audit report that limits responsibility. But here's a wonderful opportunity coming now for the profession to end the notion of audit being a commodity and begin to make it a vital part of investment analysis. The American Standards Board, PCOB, and the International Auditing and Insurance Standards Board are moving towards a different type of audit report. The UK has already gone there. Some argue that the auditor should simply give an opinion. He shouldn't get involved in other items. Well, if you believe that, in 2008, it was one of the companies that received lots of funds from the Travel Asset Reserve Prog Relief Program in the United States. The audit report in 2009, or the audits, I should say, cost $119 million. In 2009, it cost $193 million, and the audit report was word for word the same. $74 million to learn what? It's a fair presentation. Wouldn't you have liked to know why it cost $74 million more? There's a big dilemma whether the auditor should be more independent and say what he thinks or whether he should only report on things that are in the, in the financial reports. The audit committee can do that. The alternative view, which I share, is the auditor is representing the investor, not management, and should be free to comment on issues which concerns investors. Investors clearly would like the auditor to say what would concern him if he was investing in the company? What would he be interested in? What keeps him awake at night? It's good to see them moving. But the UK audit report is quite interesting. It also, like the other two, moves in the direction to asking the auditors to describe the risks of material misstatement, what has the greatest effect on audit strategy, what was the allocation of the audit staff caused by, what was the management's attention directed to, but in the UK, the auditor is required to give an overview of the scope of the audit and how the scope addressed the risks of material misstatement. That enables the auditor to understand the significance of the various aspects of the audit in its context. It's been done not as discrete opinions. It's been told we don't want boilerplate language. We want the auditor's comments to refer to that particular company. So no generic language and express it 
in language that relates to the audit. If you want an example of these audits, look up on Google the KPMG audit of Rolls-Royce last year, or the Ernst & Young audit of BP. KPMG, dealing with Rolls-Royce, stated the key areas of judgment. The significant accounting policies related to it, the audit committee's review. The areas covered dealt revenue recognition, recoverability of intangible assets, consolidation issues, evaluation of liabilities, bribery and corruption. An example of the sort of issues that they came up with was as follows. The resulting estimate was acceptable, but mildly optimistic, resulting in a somewhat lower liability being recorded than might otherwise have been the case, the valuation of a put option. We found the jud group's judgment to have been balanced, the basis of accounting in the civil, area, civil aerospace business. Overall, our assessment is that the assumptions and resulting estimates, including appropriate contingencies, resulted in mildly cautious profit recognition. Overall, you just get a balance of, well, it's probably a fair presentation. A little bit here, a little bit there, but on balance, they've tried to get it right. Ernst & Young on BP wasn't so detailed, but outlined the risks over the Gulf oil spill, the reserves of oil and gas, his ability to exercise significant influence over Rosneft. It'll be interesting to see what it does this year. Fair value accounting and the acquisition of Rosneft. Wasn't as detailed as the KPMG report, but is a much better report than one of the previous years. Now there's a competition to get to the top. KPMG is offering a Rolls-Royce type audit report if you want one as an extra. And they've been quite justifiably proud of it. One area of the audit report which hasn't been successfully ta tackled is that of the going concern. An adverse going concern opinion is very difficult to give. It can precipitate the collapse of the audited company. Sometimes we have to face facts. I remember listening to Peter Wheeler, the former British Lion in England hooker, and he was commenting about the problems of touring rugby test sites. And he said, very difficult. You've got young, hot-blooded males, wives, girlfriends, half a world away, pretty girls in South Africa, things happen. And he was talking about this young three-quarter back home, night of the tour ended, sound asleep, tucked up in bed with his wife, and suddenly from downstairs there's an almighty crash. And before he could stop himself, he shot up in bed and said, oh my God, is that your husband? But fortunately, disaster was averted. His wife was half asleep. She just rolled over and said, no, he's in South Africa. <laughs> well, when we look at what had happened in the crisis, none of the 10 top companies that received funds from the Troubled Asset Relief Programme had any going concern qualification. Out of the 10 largest bankruptcies in the United States then, only two had one. And the value of the other eight declined from 7.5 billion to 700 million, a 99% loss of value. The new proposals from the standard setters probably don't go far enough. They just say that, well, we've looked at management's assumptions and think it's okay. I think they should say what these assumptions are. Why do you think it's a going concern? In the crisis in the UK, our biggest failure was Northern Rock. If you looked at its accounts, you could see that three quarters of its liabilities came from the wholesale markets and were due within three months. And it was lending out for 25 years. Perfectly fine to say it's a going concern, provided the wholesale market stayed open, which they always had until then. But nowhere was that assumption stated. But that's what lay behind it. That would give at least the investor a chance to say, hmm, Maybe I'm not going to take that risk and get out, but put the business model and show people what, to happen, what can happen. Well, what advice can I give? I'm always wary of giving advice. When I moved into my present home near Edinburgh, in the front garden, there was a rather architecturally interesting plant which looked like overgrown parsley, but which the neighbours who didn't like the lifestyle of the previous occupant thought was marijuana. So I was a bit concerned, so I called in a horticulturalist. Um, he gave me advice I never forgot. He didn't know what it was either, but he said, look, if you're worried about this plant, he said, pick it, dry it, and then smoke it. And if you're still worried about it, then it's parsley. <laughs> <laughs> well, the new audit report is a necessary, but not a sufficient condition to greater audit quality. That needs a rebalancing of the position between the auditor and the company. Some people are trying to do it by law. 
The European Commission are now requiring rotation after 20 years, or if it's a joint audit, 24, tendering after 10, or if joint audit, 14, banning certain activities, tax, bookkeeping, etc., from public interest companies, and if you do any services for them, they're limited to 70% of the average of the last three years audit fees. They're trying to move companies away from undue influence, but more could be done. It's like the girl writing home from boarding school. She writes to her mother and says, there's been a terrible fire in the dormitory. At the last minute I was rescued by the school handyman, and now as there's no dormitory and I've fallen madly in love with him, I've been living with him in his one room flat for the last three weeks. And down the bottom of this letter to our mum, there's a PS that says there hasn't been a fire. I'm not in love with the handyman. I'm certainly not living with him. But I failed my history exam, and I want you to get it into perspective. <laughs> well, the perspective of the audit, how can we deal with that? Well, repositioning it, making the responsibility of the engagement partner more obvious, training the new professionals, and strengthening the relationship between the regulator and the auditor. Repositioning. If I were an audit committee chairman, I want the toughest order I could get to save me being splattered all over the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal. It's not sufficient to state in the audit report that the auditor is independent. It's got to be manifestly obvious. We could do things to reduce the ability of companies to put pressure on an auditor. Remove, as in many countries, including the UK, the annual appointment. If you're going to say tendering in five years or whatever it is, appoint them right through. Make the removal of the auditor more difficult. A special general meeting, with both sides putting their case. Incompetence, excessive fees, that's a good reason for firing them. Arguments when the auditor is standing up against management is not. And if you're going for tender, don't allow the price to go into the tender document. Keep it out. And then if companies asking for the price are a bit horrified and choose the next one down, get them to state that in the accounts and how much they've saved and let's see if the investors think it was worth it. The audit is becoming a decreasing portion of an audit firm's revenue. And the other aspects don't reply, rely on the fundamental exercise of scepticism. From 2008 to 2011, 418 companies in the Russell 3000 index changed auditors. The median change in audit fees was a fall of 11.5%. 62% of the companies who changed auditors reported reduced fees. If the fee was more than $3 million, 83% reported lower fees, with a median of 15.7%. Why? Is the new auditor more efficient? Was the scope of the audit reduced? Was the fee reduced by your cost to obtain a new client? Some audit committees believe a big function of their job is to drive the audit price down. That puts into jeopardy the whole financial reporting model. If audit fees are too low, auditing firms will struggle to reward staff and attract highly qualified graduates. The expert auditors of tomorrow who must be as intellectually agile as those whose work they audit. If fees fail to retain partners by maintaining their incomes, firms may try to reduce partner time and jobs, again reducing audit quality. So perhaps we should have another disclosure the audit time broken down by partner, manager, and junior staff. And let that be a visible lesson. Secondly, signing the audit report. Not an issue here, not an issue in the UK, massive issue in the United States. The relationship between investor and auditor should be personal. Star auditors, identified by their insightful audit reports, will be supported by investors at time of reappointment because of the excellent job they've done. Consequently, auditors have to be identified and required to sign the report in their own name on behalf of the firm. It makes them fully conscious of the public responsibility, but improves audit quality and helps the market to identify and weed out weak auditors. It focuses their mind, gives them a sense of greater responsibility, and ultimately their personal professional reputation is on the line. Thirdly, training of auditors. There's an unseen threat to audit qualities starting to emerge, the intergenerational issue. Today's and tomorrow's auditors need to be closely related. When I trained in Glasgow some 40 years ago, as I mentioned, there were no accounting standards, neither were any ethical standards. But I was apprenticed to a giant of the profession, Professor David Flint, father of the chairman of HSBC, Douglas Flint. 
When accounting issues came up, he would almost have a seminar with us, discussing what should be done to ensure a true and fair view was sown in the accounts. I learned so much in those early days, and above all, I learned to have backbone and a need for ethics in the profession. I didn't need to be taught it, I just watched Dave in action. It just dripped onto you. Partners would explain what they're doing and why they were doing it. They'd take you to meetings with senior management, and you'd see them in action and their unbending nature when they believed a fair presentation was not being shown in the financial statements. I frequently hear firms boasting about profits per partner. I'd like to see another metric, time spent with students per partner. I raised this with a senior partner, one of the big four, only to be told that mentoring wasn't necessary as the firm had a human resources and training department. If that's widespread, the profession's in great danger. Every qualified accountant has an obligation to his profession, and part of that is the training of youngsters entering the profession. They have to know the exact role the profession plays in the raising of finance and the running of the capital markets. They have to experience seasoned professionals doing what they should do, ensuring that information given to investors is free from bias and reflects the true economics of the situation. HR departments can't do that. We need the war horses leading the charge, showing the youngsters what this great profession is about. Leaving training to HR departments isn't delegation, it's abrogation. If a partner's time is scarce, get more partners. Accept a slightly lower return and do what you're committed to do as a professional. Pass on your knowledge, not via someone else, but directly to the accountants and auditors of tomorrow. Finally, to increase independence, the relationship between the auditor and regulator needs to be examined. The audit is one of two external forces keeping companies honest, and these two forces need to work more closely together. I would like to see a closer relationship between regulator and auditor, highlighting the auditor's public duty and assisting the regulator in his mission of serving investors. When I chaired the UK's Auditing Practices Committee in the late 80s, we struck a deal with the Bank of England. They wanted the auditor to tell them when they came across something that was pretty unsavoury. We felt that was too one-sided. If they were concerned about something in a bank, they should tell the auditor. And finally, we set out an auditing standard which required the auditor to tell the client to tell the regulator if something was found. If the client wouldn't, the auditor would. And the auditor would go directly if he felt senior management were involved in fraud or reckless behaviour. When the regulator changed, they dropped the standard. It would have been very useful in the crisis, and I'm delighted to say it's come back again. But it's not just prudential regulators. We also need securities regulators to be involved in the same thing. Well, that sounded a little bit like a sermon, and I'm aware that sermons can go on a bit. I was in church not so long ago listening to the minister banging on endlessly, and the old lady in front of me turned to her neighbour and said, is the minister no finished yet? And back came the answer, I is finished, you just can't stop. Well, <laughs> let me assure you, I can stop. I was in a pub in Ayrshire in the west coast of Scotland not so long ago and had a big sign outside saying, a pie, a pint, and a kind word. So in I went. The waitress banged down the pint, never said a word. Then she came along with a greasy congealing pie and was equally taciturn. And as she walked away, I called after her. What about a kind word? Don't eat the pie, she said. <laughs> well, let me end by giving a kind word. I think the accountant is now using accounting standards which reflect far better than before the economics of transactions involving financial instruments, leases, hopefully in the future, pensions and revenue recognition. There's still work to be done, and I've mentioned equity accounting, performance reporting, and if I were to pick another one, I'd say deferred taxation, which you probably know was written during a FASB Christmas party, and when they'd sobered up, somebody had published it. That has to change. We've got rid of much of the smoothing and matching that uh, was there before, which hid problems, and the conceptual framework will continue to transform accounting. Audit, however, is a very interesting tipping point. It's worth to society and investors as a whole, I think, is seriously underestimated. And yet now, the profession is being given a wonderful opportunity to demonstrate to the public the worth of an audit, until now, hidden behind the phrase, fair presentation. There's much to do, but change is on the way. And the increasingly important role of the accountant in the financial reporting system is changing with it. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, David, for a very entertaining and uh, provocative lecture. We've got time for a few questions. Um, so if you'd like to put your hand up, we have some roving mics. So um, there's one over here. Uh, thanks for your presentation, uh, David. Um, one thing I, I was thinking, you, you mentioned uh, the Financial Accounting Standards Board in the US, and as, as many here know, they have been the, the major holdout in terms of moving towards uh, IFRAs uh, globally. Um, would you like to make some comments about where you see that relationship, uh, given that they have cooperated with um, the International Accounting Standards Board in, in recent years uh, with, with, I guess, mixed results on, on certain new initiatives. So just wondering what, what, where you see that going uh, in the future. Well, um, you're quite right, Brendan. The, what people probably don't realise was the uh, people matter. You know, who's there at the time? And the, uh, when we were getting rid of the reconciliation that you used to have to do if you listed in the United States, uh, we spoke to the chairman of the SEC, it was Chris Cox at the time, and he was a supporter of international standards. And he was the one that got rid of the reconciliation requirement. And in 2008, he got uh, Bob Hurst, chairman of FASB, and I into the SEC. And he told us he wanted IFRS to be used in the United States in 2013. And could we finish our program by 2012? You maybe thought you were rushing it. Well, that's what we were trying to do. Uh, it wasn't publicised, but that was done behind the scenes. Then, of course, came the crisis, and suddenly companies, the last thing they wanted to do was start changing accounting standards in the middle of that. So it knocked it backwards. And then we had a, to be blunt, a chairman of the trustees of FASB who wanted to stay American. And suddenly, instead of improve IFRS and adopt it, it was stall the procedures and preserve US GAAP. It, Depends, we've got a new chairman of the SEC who's been in for a year. I think there's a fair chance in her administration we may get uh, an option to use IFRS in the States, and the automobile companies will go tomorrow if that was the case. So I think the signs are still good. You know, 130 countries using it, 20% of the Japanese markets uh, already doing it. Japan's 95% there. It's not word for word, but it's 95% of the way there. Um, India has said they'll take it in 2016. The Americans are getting left out. They were absolutely shocked when Canada did it. They were shocked when Mexico went to IFRS. Latin America's gone to IFRS. Who cares then, you know? And their, their influence is declining. When I first went to the ISB, the equity markets in the United States was 51% of world capitalization. Asia, 15%. When I left, it was 33% each. So this is where it's going to happen. And Kevin, uh, oh, where's Kevin? There he is. He was chairman of the OSSG, the horrible name, the Asian Oceanian Standard Setters Group, Kevin. Name was devised by the Chinese. And, you know, that's a group I think is going to become more and more powerful, and it certainly was under Kevin's time. But you've got a situation there where Asia can say, we think this is the answer. And frankly, we don't care what the Americans say. And I think that's extremely healthy, whereas the Americans were the big players, now there's other big players in there. So I, I think it's going to be a much more collaborative thing. And... Uh, the Americans, they're going to have to come in. You know, three quarters of the G20 are already there. More, most of the, um, not most, a majority of the uh, 500 biggest companies in the world are in IFRS. It's not going away. And nobody wants 17,500 pages of US GAAP. So once they're finished playing and sulking, they'll come in. That was off the record. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I um, enjoyed your lecture. Um, I'm Jonathan Meyer. I work for DTZ. Just wondering what you thought about um, perhaps giving the auditors, as part of their fee, an incentive to find a material mistake in the books, or alternatively tying the fee to the ongoing concern of the company. So if three years down the track, it's found that the audit report from three years ago was materially misstated. Um, that the auditors would lose a percentage of their fee? Well, if it was misstated, uh, that's, it's almost like with calling, uh, recalling bonuses from bankers, isn't it? The, the same sort of argument. That's, that's an interesting point. The, uh, I certainly wouldn't pay them if they find something, because that might be pushing it a bit much. I'm sure I could find things if I, I'd invent the uh, discrepancy, if nothing else. 
But uh, no, I, I think the audit fee, I think the audit fees are too low, bluntly. Um, I remember saying to the Bank of England, I'm surprised auditors can do bank accounts because banks are hugely complicated and to do them for the fees that they're getting, I think is disgraceful. And I think audit committees are taking a big chance if they do this. So my personal view is the audit firm should stop cutting each other's throats and the regulators should pitch in, but so should the investors. You know, it's too low. And I think we're gonna have a disaster in audit quality if we're not careful. And that would be caused by cutting corners. Do you have another question? I'm delighted. I was just wondering what clan I belong to. It's the McTurwitt. My wife gave it to me for my birthday. It's nothing to do with a clan. It's just sort of tarnish. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we have no more questions. Okay, that's the first one. Oh, there is one. Yes. David Keith Alfredson. I recognise uh, you, Keith. Yeah. I, I found your comments about order editing extremely interesting. However, you know, readers of the accounts want to know, is this a good investment not a, or a bad investment? Should I invest in it? I don't want to know the risks. I want to know whether the auditor thinks it's a good investment or a bad investment. Do you think the auditor should summarise at the final summary Make an investment, don't make an investment. <laughs> you haven't changed, Keith. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I don't think you should do that. I think that's the job of the analyst. Uh, but I, I do think the uh, auditor should make sure the information to make that decision is more visible than it is at the moment. But uh, good to see you again. <laughs> no more questions? OK. Thank you for your questions and David for your responses. I'd now call on the president of the CPA Victorian Division, CPA Australia Victorian Division, Professor, Bre Professor Brendan O'Connell, to deliver the vote of thanks on behalf of CPA Australia and the University of Melbourne and issues in closing remarks. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Lillis. Um, on behalf of CPA Australia and the University of Melbourne, I thank you all for being here tonight. Now in its 75th year, as you heard earlier, CPA Australia is thrilled to once again join with the University of Melbourne in presenting this annual research lecture. It's the oldest continuing research lecture series to be held anywhere in the world. Um, since its origins in 1940, and I was interested to hear that Professor Fitzgerald, a very famous name in uh, accounting academia, was the, the first person to give this lecture. And it's proven to be an invaluable platform for the latest thinking and research in accounting and uh, for discussion and uh, sharing of ideas as well. Um, CPA Australia is very proud of this long-standing tradition and is delighted with its ongoing partnership in this regard with the University of Melbourne. At the heart of this relationship is the belief that education empowers people and helps them realise their potential ultimately leading to the advancement of the accounting profession. As many of you here would know, CPA, CPA Australia um, has grown to become one of the world's largest accounting bodies with more than 150,000 members uh, across 121 countries. Our membership continues to grow strongly in the Asia Pacific region where we now have more than 35,000 members working in a diverse range of roles. In fact, um, earlier, just a few months ago, I was in uh, Vietnam and gave uh, presentations uh, there relating to uh, international financial reporting standards. And uh, I was amazed at the turnout that I got in both Ho Chi Minh City and Hanoi. You know, these are developing countries, and yet the, the turnouts we were getting were, was quite amazing. So there's a lot of accountants there very vitally interested in uh, uh, developments in this area and, and, and in CPA Australia itself. Um, the quality of the CPA designation is reflected in the strategic leadership and business roles our members hold. Uh, collectively, around 17% of our members hold senior leadership roles, including more than 21,000 members at CEO or CFO level. Uh, so, so that's giving you quite a bit of uh, impact. Um, ladies and gentlemen, on, on behalf of CPA Australia, 
and the University of Melbourne. Uh, thank you to Sir David Tweedy um, for your insightful presentation this evening. Um, I've been fortunate enough myself to, to hear David a few times over the years. I always find him not only to be very entertaining, um, but also very much a straight shooter who really can cut down the substance over form issues, and I think you could see that with the examples that he gave. Um, I would now invite the Chancellor of the University of Melbourne, uh, Mrs. Liz Miss Elizabeth Alexander, to present Sir David Tweedy with the University Medal. Okay, uh, that concludes the, uh, the formal part of proceedings and now comes the time where you can um, have some refreshments and some networking uh, with your uh, colleagues and uh, friends. So I'd invite you to do that. So thank you and good night. Thank you.